have one half of one, one block planted as a pilot block. Um, but I've been in discussion with some of the um, some of the members of the city who are connect connected to who um, connected to funding, and we're looking at um, capital funding supporting a build out of all of these blocks over time. Um, it could potentially be about four blocks at a time, and we would do it with contractors. Actually, this project was done solely through volunteer effort, um, specifically a lot of work from CNPS, uh, Yerba Buena chapter. Um, uh, 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 Beth Cataldo was a really big uh, a proponent of this, Paul Buscal, um, Bob, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting his last name, but they were really instrumental in making this project happen and getting volunteers together. We also worked with Climate Action Now, who um, planted the trees. They've been funded for a lot of the tree habitat that's being revitalized on the boulevard. So we've been um, really lucky to put this project forward. And if you look uh, to the right-hand side of this screen, uh, we did a bio blitz a couple of years ago, and we actually followed it up with another bio blitz that um, mostly I think CNPS members did in 2020. But what we're looking to do is have um, a record of kind of before and after, like before we started putting these pilot blocks in, what kind of um, wildlife are we finding on the boulevard? And does it change? And do we see an increase in numbers? And that's the hope, of course, to see like this uh, this goal of biodiversity. Is it working? This is what we're putting our money into. <laughs> this is what our, we're putting our time into. And so we're really hoping that um, that uh, that progresses and uh, we can get the funding for it. There there are multiple streams out right now that we're kind of reaching out to to, to make this a funded project, but eventually maybe the whole of the boulevard will have this type of look to it with some wildflower meadows, some coastal scrub habitat, and then also the Monterey Cypress has kind of the iconic image of it. Um, I see some, is, I think that's the only other slide I had, is that correct? Uh, Maya? Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. So that's that's kind of the, the majority of the one project I, I have prepared here, but um, we are working on a number of other um, projects that native plantings have a part of in San Francisco. And in fact, um, there's a whole, uh, there's a, a biodiversity memo that's supported by a lot of the organizations within the city. And so um, planting native plants and really kind of looking at where that's the most appropriate in public spaces is a big part of our conversation on all of the projects that we do. Um, sometimes they, they don't work in certain situations just because of the type of um, foot traffic we receive, we receive how much of a beating they're going to take. Like we really have to really have to kind of selectively choose um, where they go, but we're trying to do as much as possible. I think at this point, it's, um, it's not an unknown. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much, Solange. And I think we have a few minutes left and there's some good questions popping up. Someone sure, asked, sure. how many miles does this project stretch? And, and I know that, you know, maybe you can answer like what the entirety of Sunset Boulevard is and perhaps what is the current slice that you've been able to. Yes. Convert. So it's, it's two and a half miles. The one block that we did, I can't, um, I think it's 900 feet by 100 feet about, it's about 1,000 feet by 100 feet is the one block that we took on. Um, and of that block, I would say one third of it is wildflower meadow, one third is coastal scrub. <laughs> but um, just to plant that kind of space, it took a really large team of volunteers over, my goodness, um, you know, three to four months really getting it planted. And, and of course the maintenance and the continued watering of it and keeping it from getting overgrown with weeds in these first few years is going to take a while too. So um, when we do it with, with a contractor, it'll be a different type of situation, of course, but um, even a small amount of space <laughs> in, this, in this large median takes a lot of effort. Yeah, yeah. Um... So I think those daisy-like yellow flowers, a, quite, a person just asked, I think those are tidy tips. Yes, um, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. And then we also have a, a lupin in there. Um, and yeah, I, I can't remember that. It was a, yeah, I'll have to go back to my planting plan to remember what I called everything out of. Yeah, the baby blue eyes, yeah. Mm -hmm. baby blue eyes. Uh, so we, someone asked, uh, and we'll just do a, a couple more questions here. Um, do you know how members of the public have responded to the block that's been done? It's been really positive. Um, when we were uh, 
when we were presenting to the public, there was a mix. There were some people who were interested in seeing more natives and some people who said, we love it as it was, why can't it be what it was? And we're, we're really trying to shift away from just trees and grass because of the, the water use on turf. Um, and that's part of this exploration too for more native, native plants, although it takes water use to get things established, of course, but um, yeah. Got it. And who's, who's managing the the watering, cultivation, tending, like who's, who's kind of like the horticultural stewards? Mostly CNPS Yerba Buena and the volunteers awesome. that they've been working with. Some of the people who have worked come out are uh, from Nature in the City, too, is another San Francisco organization. Great. And Climate Action Now, they're managing the trees. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, Solange. Uh, sure. We'll turn to our next panelist here. Um, should I, I'm sorry to interrupt David, should I add, answer people's questions in the chat as I oh, can? Oh, sure, please, yeah. please do, yeah, okay. as, as you, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so cool. I'd like to uh, welcome Jesse Chang up to the digital floor <laughs> here. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Jesse Chang uh, developed this gorgeous nature garden at the Garvey Intermediate School. Um, and I also want to say too, check out uh, this uh, nature garden on our, Grow Care Everywhere page. I'll type the URL in just a second in the chat, but there's actually a 360 tour of both this garden as well as the Sunset Boulevard planting. You can actually explore it in 360 degrees. There's plant tags on there that tell you the different species and it will just really give you a sense of scale and um, demonstrate the kind of context of these, of these native plants. So I'll put that URL in just a second, but um, Jesse, this garden is just so beautiful. So I'm, we're really excited to have you talk about how you've cultivated this uh, campus garden. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so I, I just, I'm gonna take just a few minutes to kind of answer the question I've been kind of thinking as I was preparing, like why, why native habitats in schools? Uh, and I had a conversation with my daughters about to turn 12 about the kind of education she was getting about the environment and pretty much it was like global warming, you know, the rainforests are all burning up. Um, there's trash everywhere in the ocean and basically a very bleak kind of environmental education that she was getting about the natural world. And I said, well, how did that make you feel? And she's like, it made me feel like anxious and I kind of didn't want to think about it anymore. Um, and, and I think that, that that has something, you know, that kind of disconnect. And then also for fourth grade, um, I was probably the only, uh, I they were learning about you know early California history and they're actually natives planted on campus and so I said well I, I think your class was probably the only one who ever actually went outside to learn about things that you were reading in books um, and she's like yeah that was probably true um, and so I think there's this profound disconnect uh, with kids like my my own kids who, who grew up in the city uh, this disconnect with nature um, but then when they do learn about nature in the natural world, it's kind of doom and gloom. Uh, and so I was just thinking about, I was kind of rereading some, some uh, work and there's an environmental educator uh, out in the, uh, the East Coast, uh, David Sobel. And he, there's a quote here that I think is really important as, I, as I've been thinking, reflecting on the work that I've been doing at different schools. So what's important is that children have an opportunity to bond with the natural world to learn to love it and feel comfortable in it before being asked to heal its wounds. And then he quotes um, John Burroughs, the naturalist, knowledge without love will not stick, but if love comes first, knowledge is sure to follow. And I think that's kind of what I think undergirds what I, what I hope, to, hope to see uh, in these school gardens is that we, we help these, uh, these kids, like my kids, all these urban kids growing up in the cities, to be able to kind of have some profound connections um, with nature and with their with with what's actually in their neighborhood, not not rainforests miles and miles away, but actually what is actually around them and what is the ecosystem around them. And so, just imagine for on the left hand side, like this is a this is a view of the meadow, um, kind of blocking the vernal pool, which is on the right. Um, but before we started this project, it was basically just all uh, dirt and grass and, and a weedy lot. And as I've talked, I've just shared this garden with other people who have gone through like generations of, of students at this particular intermediate school. They all said, yeah, it was pretty much just all a, a dirt, dirt lot, a, you know, dirt and grass lot for us as long as we've been there. And so they're like, it's so great that there's actually something beautiful there now. 
Um, and so on the right-hand side, you'll see also, um, we actually did get a vernal pool installed um, after about a year of uh, conversations and uh, um, negotiations. Um, next slide. So again, and part of the way we talk about it is like, how do we create an outdoor classroom? How is this gardens uh, going to be used um, that's gonna benefit the students in the school community? Um, so uh, on the left-hand side, that's also Garvey. We, we developed a relationship with uh, Cal State LA, some of the plant, uh, um, the botany professors. Uh, so they've been coming out regularly to do plant, uh, their plant physiology students, uh, college students actually come out and then they basically teach about plants uh, in the garden to the science, uh, the science uh, students at Garvey Intermediate. On the right-hand side is actually a different garden that I did after this one, uh, partnering with Pasadena Autobahn, but part of the design that we incorporated in this was to, to you know, where the kids are jumping on there was like having, you know, kind of basically a log classroom in the corner that um, classrooms can actually come in, enter through the garden, and actually be able to sit and, and have lessons uh, taught there. Uh, the next slide. So uh, collaboration is key. Um, uh, you know, having students uh, working on it was was a great thing. The community groups, uh, the scouts. Um, uh, but I think one of the big things that I've learned through these projects is some of my projects have failed because I didn't get the full buy-in from from key stakeholders. Like if you don't have facilities on board. Uh, if you just have like blockages in certain areas, then it doesn't matter if you got like maybe 60 or 70 percent of, of the buy in. If you don't get close to 90, um, it's really hard to um, get a project either finished or have it be sustainable for the long term. And so that collaboration is huge when it comes to getting things done. Go ahead. And so, like I mentioned, the vernal pool, uh, that was something where facilities helped dig out. It's about uh, 15, 20 feet uh, in diameter. Um, the kids kind of helped finish the dig out. Uh, we put a liner, I worked with, uh, again, collaborated with a group called Save the Frogs that I've never built uh, um, uh, um, a wetland uh, before. And so we, we had uh, somebody come out from Save the Frogs to help us with that and make sure that everything was level and was going to drain out the, the right way. And then the last slide. The last slide is basically uh, the viewpoints. Those are my kids looking at the, the fairy shrimp that were um, seeded from another school garden pool uh, in LA. And um, uh, there are vernal pool plant species as well that, that transferred as well. Um, but my kids are kind of looking up towards the towards the um, the mule fat kind of screen there. Um, that's where the, the the meadow you can see in front is starting to grow in um, from the fall rains. And then looking uh, the 2021 is looking the other direction um, towards the parking lot uh, area where the the kids recreate. Um, yeah, so. That was probably the, the best part that, that I enjoyed about this start. And we also have the other collaboration and the thing that to help convince get this project done was uh, we got uh, our, our local vector control coming in to um, monitor the pool when it's full. Um, and so, but that's been, that's been great. You know, they, they just come in, make sure it's checked to make sure there's no mosquitoes and kind of help allay any fears that some of the school community had when, when we were talking about having standing water. And that's all I got. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, look forward to asking you some, some questions in our panel discussion. Um, all right. So I'll welcome our, our third guest of the evening, Kathy Capone. Uh, she is a CNPS garden ambassador, uh, which means she's an active volunteer who shares her horticultural knowledge, her garden. She was actually recently featured in our Flora magazine, uh, the spring issue. So you can check out her a uh, beautiful Central Valley garden in that issue. And she's also involved with the Thule River Parkway, um, which factors into our conversation tonight. So welcome, Kathy. Hi, I'm so glad to be here and be able to talk to people across the state. Welcome everybody. This is the city of Porterville. Porterville, um, we didn't see that slide with the map on it, did we? 
anyway, so city of Porterville is between Fresno and Bakersfield along the east side of the valley. And uh, just to let you know a little bit about who I am, in our local chapter, the Alta Peak chapter, I am the horticultural chair. I, I'm also the chair of the, the chapter grant uh, program, and I am the chapter's delegate to the chapter council. On chapter council, I am the chapter council's delegate to the board, so I serve on the CNPS board of directors in that capacity. Locally, I'm also the president of the Tule River Parkway Association, which is a local nonprofit um, whose purpose um, is to develop public access and uh, biological diversity in the Tule River corridor. So I'm going to be showing you a project that we've been doing since I applied for a grant in 2018 from U.S. Fish and Wildlife called the Wildlife Partners Grant. And this grant provides a 50% matching, 50-50 matching reimbursement grant, uh, which, um, which supports uh, wildlife diversity. So what you see on the left-hand side of your screen is uh, mule fat, Baccarus silicifolia. And then on the right-hand side, that's an elderberry. Next slide, please. We have 18 native plant gardens uh, in this parkway garden project. And these are native plant demonstration gardens. Um, and each one is adopted by a different community group. So the community group on the right are a group of cadets. So these are middle school and upper elementary age uh, California cadets from two different school districts led by one um, cadet commander. And uh, they have a large garden in four parts um, that I'd love to show you more about. And what they're doing right there is they're planting the uh, planting a variety of native plants through the cardboard for the sheet mulching. In the center, you'll see a circle cut out. And that circle cut out in the center is a um, place where a riser is available which I will then, after we get the plants in and get the wood chips in, I'll put in half inch black tubing, you know, uh, in, in the wood mulch, wood chips, and then emitters from that black tubing. On the left-hand side of your screen, you'll see three girls. This is uh, just three of the girls from a Girl Scout troop, uh, Troop 638. Um, and they have adopted a section of the gardens that they called the butterfly habitat garden. What you see there is the very beginning of their garden and they have cre created a willow fence um, from uh, scrap uh, wood cuttings from my yard and then willow boughs from the river garden area. Um, that is protecting their garden from things like um, off-road vehicles that use illegally use the river corridor for recreation. Next slide, please. Okay, the, the picture on your left is one of the cadets. So in addition to adopting a four part, uh, four section garden with a plaza that they're building in the middle with scrap um, bricks and scrap chunks of cement, they also adopted a large section where they are reforesting it with willows. So the group planted 26 trees, 25 of them were willows and one was a sycamore in a large area, which the, all, and all of the trees have underground uh, supplied irrigation to them. Of these 18 gardens, 17 of them have underground irrigation supplied through an automatic timer. Um, and it, I want to report to you. So this uh, willow, uh, willow forest was planted in December and January uh, of this uh, last winter, and only one of those trees failed. And they, they, the students went to this the other last weekend, and I had them look at why did that tree fail, and that they diagnosed the problem and came up with I think the a real good answer to that, they had planted that particular willow too high and had gotten dry and had and it had died. So I was so happy that 25 of the 26 trees lived. 
The picture you see on the right is from a group of um, seniors who, uh, senior citizens who decided to make a memorial garden for the founder of the Tule River Parkway Association. So the woman you see in the blue pants there, that's the daughter of Don Zucksworth. So Kathy Zucksworth there and her husband and um, other parts of the family have come together to do a garden in memory of the founder of the Tule River Parkway Association. All these gardens have only native plants. Thank you for going to the next slide. Okay, so what you see here is a one year time span. The, the picture on your left uh, was done, was taken in, uh, was taken in October of 2019. The picture on your right was taken in October of 2020. So from on your left, they cleaned out the weeds and the brush that they didn't want and they did uh, the underground irrigation and the sheet mulching and they put in rocks and they put in plants and those uh, fuchsias are already blooming like crazy last summer, last fall. Next. And the next slide also has some, a picture of this garden in a different aspect. Next slide, thank you. Okay, so this is the same garden. The picture on the right are some of the students this garden was adopted by the Burton School District and it was called the Burton Children's Garden. And those are some of the volunteers who came out. You can see the sheet mulching there on the ground. And I believe I can see some um, plants uh, in that sheet mulching. And if you look on the left, the uh, plants in the background to the right are Yerba Santa, which is currently blooming. And the picture on the left is a very current picture. It was taken late April. Um, so of this year. So the Yerba Santa is blooming and then the, in the garden you have a variety of um, fuchsia. Okay, so this picture on there, so 18 gardens, it's going to take a lot of native plants. The picture on the left is part of my backyard and these are some of the plants. So I do uh, native plant propagation and housing of plants that we buy from other nurseries. So it's in the Central Valley, we need shade cloth to uh, so that the plants don't uh, dry out too much. Today it's 91 degrees here. So the picture on the right is a salvia. It's a salvia brandigii um, called P uh, Pacific Blue. And what you see there is a western swallowtail butterfly. Next. Okay, so this group um, is, uh, this is a garden that's still being planted. The picture on the left was this last fall and the picture on the right is uh, er, well, January of this year. So this is uh, the group that adopted this garden is Alianza Ecologista. And um, on the left, they're clearing out the weeds and lever leveling the soil a bit. And on the right, they decided they wanted to do a raised bed. And so we have various, because this is on, we're funding it on a shoestring and with donations. What I did do is I advertise on Facebook in other ways to get uh, rocks and waste cement chunks and other materials. All, all of the wood chips are donated. Uh, all of the cardboard is donated. So we uh, make use of what we can. So on the right-hand side, this is Dahlia Gonzalez and Dahlia and her, her friend created this raised bed area. And they plan to plant that this raised bed and finish planting the garden this weekend. They have a work day. They're anticipating 10 volunteers coming out to help finish up the garden planting. Next slide. So thank you, Dahlia. Oh, I wanna tell you something about Dahlia. Dahlia is a wonderful person who I met over a year ago now as a high school senior. She came out and did part of her senior project at the gardens and she was so interested in the native plant gardens and how this can better the community. Um, she joined a group and she is the lead person for this Alianza Ecologista local uh, environmental group to support, uh, to 
And she encourages and manages that group to adopt this native plant garden and maintain it. Okay, so this garden is the only garden in the project that has no underground irrigation. We designed it by selecting uh, the plants and the way we planted them so it can ex these plants uh, exist in Porterville without additional water once established. So we've been watering, hand watering them very occasionally to get them through the summer. And you'll see in, the, um, in just a moment how, what, how they have done. So the picture on the left top is the gardens, is the area before it started to be worked on. The left bottom is the slide is the adopter and his friend who's out there doing the initial weeding. What you see in the middle is one of the um, white sages that were planted. And you see that there's the uh, uh, cement chunks kind of reinforcing the planting basin so that the water will be retained um, and the soil will re be retained until the white sage can uh, send out its roots. And on the right, that was the first year's planting. So they were a small section of a bladder pod planted in the gardens the first planting season. Next. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the same garden, the same garden a year later. So this is the bladder pod and you'll also see, note that there is California buckwheat there uh, in this garden. There's also white sage and yucca whippoli, um, Hesperia yucca whippoli. So these, all of these plants grow in this climate without summer water once established, and they are doing fantastically. These a bladder pod bloomed all year last year, and they bloomed all winter long. All winter long, these plants had yellow flowers on them. Right now, they have very few flowers that bloom themselves into all they have is seed pods all over with very few flowers. But I think as soon as they drop those seed pods, they'll start flowering again. So I am just absolutely amazed at this bladder pod. It, it, is, locally, it is locally native and it, it uh, occurs widely from Fresno South in California in the dry areas. Next slide, please. I think that's it, Kathy. Oh, okay. There was one last one, but I think that'll be fine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. All right, so I invite all three of our panelists and our two expert horticulture engagement staff members to uh, join us in this panel discussion. So thank you all for sharing your really uh, distinct perspectives and experiences in this subject. Um, these questions are just meant to get at some, you know, some kind of uh, specific aspects of gardening in a very public environment. So I'll start us off with this question, and this is for everybody. Feel free to jump in. Um, plants have to stand up to a lot of traffic in public environments. Solange definitely uh, noted that. What are some resilient species to consider um, in these contexts that you all work in? And perhaps what are some to avoid? It just depends. Um... It depends on the context a lot of the time. Um, what we're seeing in this pilot block endeavor, it's a little bit off the beaten path. People aren't walking through it, which they often do in public medians. Um, this, it's a wide enough of a median and there's a sidewalk all around it that we're not seeing maybe a ton of foot traffic trampling. Um, but I was about to respond to a question I had in saying that if, if we were to explain this particular project, we would buy larger plant stock um, because we want it to be bigger and in people's way so they won't step on it. We actually had a lot of smaller plants that we were trying to, to plant to promote biodiversity, but I think in the long run, those type of plants can really get run, up, run, run over by weeds and people and um, end up, uh, they're too precious. They end up um, not being able to withstand public spaces as well. Um, some plants do pretty well in public spaces that are smaller, like uh, yarrow can actually kind of take a beating. So it just depends. <laughs> it really, it just depends on your context and how much time you, you have to maintain it as well. It's another piece of it. Um, some resilient species, I would say just, we're, we're trying to do coastal scrub species in particular this time. So we're looking at, we're doing Bacchus, we're doing Lupin, um, our Lupinus um, Arboreus and Chamaesonis. Um, we're doing Artemisia and 
a, a couple of sages. Uh, Ceanothus does really well. So again, those are all like the larger, larger shrubs and we would probably endeavor to plant more of those bigger plants in the next time around. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, I have a couple of things to add in if I could. Please. Yeah, yeah. Deer grass is stood up very well to traffic and fuchsia has done very poorly with traffic. So fuchsia is very brittle, but if we still plant it because it's such a great plant, and it will come back from the roots if it's stomped on, but the, the plant itself will, will break down, but it will come back. So um, I would still go with trying fuchsia. And we have uh, found that putting rocks around really helps. Um, and we're gonna be putting some more fuchsias in with kind of rocks dispersed throughout the fuchsia planting to try to discourage walking in that area. Uh, I was going to say so. the bacchus is another really a uh, pretty hardy uh, uh, stand up to things kind of plant, um, and you know the buckwheat because it grows quickly. Um, although it is an individually brittle kind of plant, it seems to do pretty well because it. It, it established itself quickly. And on the small plants versus big plants um, discussion, one of the things that we found works with using small plants is putting little plant flags on each one. If you little put a little plant flag there, even though it might get stolen, they're very inexpensive. And um, it will, it really deters some people from stepping on your plant and it lets your plant, um, your vault, well, that's your volunteers know where the plant is that you want to keep. That's great, great insight. Thank you. And Jesse, I, I mean, when you're dealing with a, with a garden kind of in the heart of a school campus where you have students running around and through it all the time, like what are, what are your considerations? And maybe there's even a dimension in all of this to safety too, right? I mean, how do you ensure you're not planting something that, that might prove pokey or dangerous? <laughs> To someone who's not paying close attention, perhaps. Yeah, no, when we first planted, we, we did the same thing as Kathy with the flags, you know, just getting those from Home Depot and just uh, making sure we flag everything. Um, there wasn't too much loss. Um, and now, because this the soil is pretty, pretty good clay, um, it's actually trying to keep the plants away from the kids, um, especially in the, especially in the pathways because uh, they, they're just super happy and spreading all over. So um, so almost everything has worked in, in our space, uh, almost, to a, almost to a fault. Awesome, well, thank you all, that was great. All right, let's go to our next question here. So the next question is, how do you convince community members and members that you're wanting to start a native garden to you know invest in growing native plants in public spaces? Because this is still, out of the ordinary in a lot of public spaces to have a native plant garden. So, you know, what are some tips that you all have to convince, um, you know, policymakers or community members to start growing natives in these, the public sphere? That's a great one for, particularly for schools and for small businesses too. So I think you guys have worked with a couple of those. One of the ways that helped me convince the city as I wrote the grant to support it, I brought money and my long-term um, uh, known work with in the city of Porterville. So it was that the city uh, employees and the city council knew me and knew that they could trust me. And then I brought them money and they uh, that was a big help. Um, I find that there are many people in the public who are interested in knowing about native plants and native plant gardens. We're not underwhelmed. I mean, we are, we have the interest in native plants. What we don't have is the supply of native plants to be bought in nurseries. So I grew a lot of the native plants that we're putting in these gardens. Uh, yeah, for, for Garvey Intermediate specifically, um, I was able to sell it to the superintendent by a, a previous project that was successful. Um, and showing showing kind of the beauty of it, the lower maintenance costs, the fact that there's nothing that was there's nothing ever been done in that space, as well as the potential educational um, opportunities um, for for usage um, by the school community.
I think um, where we are in San Francisco, there are actually a lot of community members who already support growing native plant species. So um, it's not as hard of a sell as it might be in other areas of the state and country. Um, one, of the, one of the things that people seem to not like about native plants is the aesthetic. So something about showing them, showing people that an aesthetic, that, that the plants have a beauty to them and that they can have an aesthetic to them that is maybe different from a conventional garden, but is still shaped in a way that's appealing is really important. Um, sorry, that's my little daughter saying my name outside the door. But um, one of the things in landscape architecture that we learn is that if you create a, a, a border around something, even if it's like um, a, a, a a, a turf band around a space. It looks contained and neater. And so that's just one way to kind of sell the look of native plants as if it kind of looks more contained than wild. Um, I would also say that uh, sometimes it, it, coming with a grant, like Kathy said, is also really helpful to be able to, to um, say that, yes, you have a plan is really a, a good way to start the conversation. Great, thanks for all that insight. I think it's really great to hear all your different perspectives and you know different ways to approach um, you know the benefits of native plants and it does seem like having a plan and um, just understanding you know the counter arguments that people might have I think are all important in that sense. Um, this kind of goes along with what we just discussed, but in your words, what are the general benefits of growing, growing native plants in community spaces? I know we talked about the education and all of that, but if there's anything else you can add about the benefits of growing native plants in community and public spaces. Sorry, was that a question? I couldn't quite hear it. Yeah, yeah. Really <laughs> <laughs> yeah so what are, what do you all think in your own words the benefits of growing native plants are? Oh, it's really a lot about habitat, um, yeah. providing habitat. And uh, I, I, uh, as much as it's in the media and talking about, um, you know, our the, the loss of many insects and pollinators, I mean, we were, we want to support that and that's really what native plants can do and support the, the local species as well as non-local species really. I mean, there are generalists and specialists for lots of different kinds of plants. And so um, sometimes it's about talking, like edu educating about what those, what those creatures are that we want to try to support and the importance of them and, and the, the larger, uh, picture of biodiversity and where we live. Um, and that's just, sometimes that's through signage, sometimes that's through educational programs. It really just depends on uh, what your media for marketing is in a way. And it is marketing, which is kind of strange, but it is something that sometimes you have to engage in to be able to sell an idea. So what the reason that I did the project there on the Tule River Parkway is much the same to demonstrate to the public what native plant gardens can look like because people won't know how to design a native plant garden or that they really want one until they see one. And in this area of the state, there are very few uh, homes that are landscaped with native plants. So that we have a real water shortage problem here in Porterville. We have a dropping, a significantly dropping water table. And so by planting, using native plants in the home and commercial landscapes, we're saving up to 80% of the water we would otherwise use in landscapes. So that was very important. Also our, our natural habitat along the river, the river has been managed as an irrigation corridor for years and years and years by, um, by the irrigation districts and the interests uh, that have purchased the water that runs in the Thule River. In doing this, they have eliminated almost all understory plants. So we have some, um, we have some willows and we have some other trees, but all of the shrubs and the annuals and the smaller plants have been plowed under as part of um, a fire, uh, abatement, you know, weed abatement to protect against fires. So uh, what we're doing is we're re 
enriching the native plant diversity in the river corridor. And then uh, getting volunteers out into the native plant, into the river corridor and along the Thule River is another big um, reason that I did this project because very few people know about, this is a public park with a paved parkway path, but very few people know about it or use it. But getting, giving people families and groups a reason to come out to the gardens, they will then know about this parkway and be able to use it and show it to other people. Yeah, I think just going back to my quote, um, just because it's for the, the school community, just giving the opportunity for our for our students to connect with with their with their context, you know, their immediate ecological context. And it, and it's kind of funny, like we say it's for the kids, but I think oftentimes we end up having to educate the adults as well. Um, they oftentimes are are kind of complaining, like, hey, it kind of gets brown in the summer and I have lizards in my classroom. I've had to take two, I've had to, you know, export some of those lizards back into the garden. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really about creating the, at least the possibility that kids are gonna connect, the, the school community is gonna connect with what's actually, you know, um, what's actually Californian, <laughs> not everything else that they're surrounded by. And it's wonderful to get uh, young people out in the gardens. One of the gardens was developed and planted by a group of 10 year old girls and their moms. So these four 10 year old girls convinced their moms to adopt this garden. And it was only built by women. The only man who had a hand in building this particular one garden of the 18 was a dad. And he came to, along to take care of the toddler while the moms and the daughters built the garden. It was a wonderful like bonding experience for these women and girls. That's amazing. I, I think what's such an important part in this work is kind of the, the educational aspect and maybe you could say the interpretation because at face value, someone might not know what's going on with native plants in, the, in a given situation. And so can you speak to that? I think Solange, you mentioned that um, you're interested in coordination with the Yerba Buena chapter and um, Climate Action Now to implement interpretive signage. Can, can you all maybe speak to how you try to communicate what you're doing to your community, whether that's through like interpretation or programming, but just make people aware that, hey, this is going on. It's not, you know, just this kind of quote unquote wild space or, you know, something that's just haphazardly has come into being. Like, how, how do you kind of communicate that? One piece of feedback that, um... I, I've gotten from the volunteers who are working on the pilot blocks is that um, communication with the community has come much more frequently from people who walk by it and ask questions about why it's there, seeing somebody taking care and, and putting time and, and, and effort into managing the space. Um, and so sometimes it's having people, I think, in, in those spaces is one really great way to just have direct communication with community members who see it every day. Um, but the, the signage piece is great because it can be a legacy item that lasts years that um, uh, in this particular area, there's a juncture um, at, at Terraval it's at, and 37th and on Sunset Boulevard, there's a, uh, uh, there's a, a muni line that stops there. And so um, not only our neighbors near that area, but a lot of the general public are coming through too. Um, so we hope to have signs there that actually express more information about why support biodiversity, what are the actual plants that we have here, what's the bigger picture for this project. Um, yeah, and, 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 then, and then the kind of community outreach through education that that piece we hope to do more of, um, but there are a number of public schools and private schools nearby, and we'd like to bring them into doing um, bio blitzes again for the boulevard and actually having the students have a, a hand in kind of navigating and, and being aware of what's planted right in front of them, basically. Great, thank you. We're planning to do two things. We're looking at doing uh, the, um, the breakfast rotary, um, I just spoke with one of the leaders in the breakfast rotary and he, the breakfast rotary has a club in each of the high schools called react. And we're looking at having the react groups 
make, um, the breakfast rotary is talking about buying two signs, one at the beginning and one at the end. And then at each garden, there's gonna be a plaque with some kind of, it might be a QR code or some other kind of a notification to people walking in the gardens, which they can use to uh, access an audio file for that garden. So we're gonna have an audio file for each of the gardens that people go to. And then we'd also pre previously talked about having a QR code at each of the garden signs and each of the gardens will have a sign recognizing the adopter of the garden and its name and that kind of thing. And the QR code will take them to a list of the plants in the garden and some uh, resource materials about those plants. Oh, that's awesome. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah, for us, I think there's two things, the passive education of putting more signage in just to kind of help people, you know, adults and students you know, know what, what they're looking at um, and, and why it's important. Um, and then, uh, you know, looking, I'm currently looking for grants for the new school year to try to, you know, deepen that connection with the Cal State LA um, Botany Department and trying to see if I got a student who can kind of help with the maintenance, but then also give more continuous opportunities for education either in the school or with the after school program, uh, which I've had conversations about pre-pandemic. Awesome, all right, I think we can go on. We just have a few minutes left and I think we just have two questions. So we'll try to make it succinct. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, what is the most, it, what is most important to a successful public garden um, would you would you consider in these three factors design, construction, or maintenance? Well, I, for me, like the the first two are really important at the beginning, but uh, I, my my experience is always easier to build a garden. And everyone has the big hooray and the ribbon cutting. Um, it's it's what happens after that, like the maintenance, the continuous education, uh, continuing to build. Um, ongoing partnerships, um, especially if there's like uh, in the school context, like if an administrator leaves, you know, if there's switching of administrators or the teacher, the kind of teacher who championed it retires or, you know, all these kinds of factors that are really, um, you know, part of the, uh, the, the challenge, I think, of, of, of working in a public space and especially in a public school. Um, so, so for me, it's been it, uh, getting garden in is easy. It's the it's the maintenance and the the kind of ongoing sustainability. There is a challenge in maintenance. I mean, if you don't have the good good design and good construction, then the maintenance, you know, you can't go anywhere after that. But um, I, yeah, I guess you can replant. Right? <laughs> but one of the things that's important in maintenance in my kind of way of working with the public is that you need to continually reach out to partnerships, uh, additional partnerships. Don't, don't, um, when you have the initial partnerships, don't expect that you're going to have all those same people through time. You need to continue to have new people joining in the process. And I'm 71. I need to know that I am not going to be able to continue this past, well, maybe 20 years, I'll be good, but um, don't leave it just for me. Make sure I'm bringing young people in, developing the leadership that can continue this advocacy uh, for the native plants in Porterville. Absolutely. Um, Jesse and Kathy basically said everything I would say. I, I think that maybe I would lean more heavily on maintenance even over design and construction at this point, because I work for public works and um, keeping things going is very hard because it, the information has to get passed on to the right people over and over again. And um, maintenance in, in, um, and in terms of pu public works maintenance, it's an, it's an educational piece. So um, if you design something too complicated, 
um, it won't get cared for. It actually has to be something that, um, because people won't have that much time and it's a huge city and <laughs> there are only so many gardeners on staff. Like um, you really have to design for like, what's the quickest, easiest way to deal with something, which is kind of what we were trying to do for Sunset Boulevard. And the coastal scrub areas that we have are in kind of a rectangular space so that you can mow around them. Um, maybe they'll get weeded, maybe they won't in the future. And so really the idea is just plant as robustly as possible and maybe assume that maintenance is not always going to be perfect. So um, yeah, so planning for things to, to be kind of simple is, is really important. All right, well, thank you all so much. I think we're just gonna kind of zip past this, this last question here just because of time. Um, and I wanna be able to close this out. But um, first of all, just thank you three. And, and of course, Maya and Anne-Marie, thank you all for being part of this fabulous webinar. I hope the audience has enjoyed it. Um, uh, I've certainly learned a lot. So we'll be posting a recording of this webinar up um, as soon as possible. I'm aiming for tomorrow and we'll let everyone know and give everyone the link to the recording via email. Um, and I wanna give you a couple action steps to take tonight. One is to use calscape.org if you are not already. Jump on that URL and you can enter your address. Um, if you wanna just do your zip code, that's fine. We're not recording your information, but you can literally get a plant list specific to your address or your zip code. So it's really, really cool. Um, and so you'll, you'll come away with a great list. You'll also be able to locate plants uh, based on nursery availability. So it's not a perfect system, but you do get a sense for nurse, native plant nurseries throughout California and what has sold a given species over time. Uh, you can also save and bookmark plants, which is really cool. So if you want to kind of develop, you know, your dream list of plants for your yard, it's really great. Um, so yeah, please use Calscape. Uh, we have a couple native plant uh, sale, chapter plant sales uh, still going on, I think, or coming up. And we also, of course, you know, really try to celebrate our native plant nursery partners. Um, and there's many across the state. Again, I, I would say to use calscape.org and that nursery page is a great resource. Um, and then the last couple of things I'll say just related to these fabulous panelists we have here, you can actually learn more about each of them via CNPS. I put the link for the Native Plant Week uh, URL. That's going to show you Jesse's and Solange's uh, spaces, landscapes that they've been working on in 360 degrees. And also our Flora Magazine has Kathy Capone in her personal residential garden. So she also brings native plants home, <laughs> which is really cool. And she has some really cool uh, yuccas. Um, so anyway, check that out, uh, the physical magazine. And if you don't get that, you can become a member uh, and you'll get that in the mail. So thank you panelists and everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, have a great night. Thank you all. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank you.